Uh, you heard a little bit of myself. So this is the list of uh, the conferences. Uh, I, I, I did not plan for, to program sharing all of them. It happened by accidentally, but it's also like a lot of fun actually working on a program with the speakers in the community. So I like to get around a little bit about a company. I'm one of the partners at Königsweg, so we are um, a very uh, diverse and heterogeneous team. So we serve like consultancy on data science projects. We work with startups, but we can also help companies with communication. Uh, so it's uh, like super, yeah. But it's, I, I love it. It's just like very nice to, um, uh, to talk to, to work on all these different levels with great people. So um, enough about myself. Um, what's your background? So. Who's a data scientist? Okay. There's only 50% data scientists here. Okay, interesting. Who's a database admin? Wow, two people. Yes, okay. Uh, who's more like a curious Pythonista? Okay. And who's a consultant, decision maker, or IT executive, or YouTube influencer? <laughs> okay, cool. I'd expected more data scientists, actually, but that's right. Um, so um, what's your experience? Uh, relational databases. Real quick, we have to save some time. OK. Heard about it? No SQL systems. OK, a little bit left. So um, Hadoop and Sparks and everything around it. So OK, OK, I see, I see it, like 50% have knowledge in relational databases and only like 10% on NoSQL and Hadoop. So that, that's, that's great, because we can, we can really build up on that. Um, so uh, what are you looking for? Um, it's more like, uh, let me answer the question for you, because we have to save some time. So uh, because there's basically three angles to look on databases for data science. Um, it's choosing a database uh, for your data science project um, and evaluating an existing system for data for your data science requirements and how to integrate into an existing ecosystem. Because if you start working at a company, you cannot say, oh, I, I like this database. Can you please change your uh, the infrastructure? And how did I actually come up with the idea? Actually, it was Emma. Well, you didn't see that coming. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, she asked me last year, can you do something on SQL, an SQL tutorial for your SciPy? And I said, why? Because I come from more like, I, I used to work a lot of databases, and I came more from databases and building applications to data science and deep learning and all this stuff. So for me, it was natural to use a database to support anything I was doing in data science. And I just thought, OK, there seems to be a gap, and I thought about it. and. I thought, okay, yeah, maybe it's um, uh, maybe there's a gap because if you see tutorials from universities and online, it's almost everything is file based. You hardly hear of a database at all, so um, there's a gap. So, and if I want to see what uh, basically the uh, stereotypes are, I ask usually I ask Google. So, what is a database scientist and database admin, and what might they have in common? Have in common. So, let's check the Google search. And we see database, uh, like, oh, no, sorry, there. Um, that's the data scientists here. You see all, like, many people with glasses and heroes, and uh, basically this is the data scientist stereotype. Um, the database admin stereotype, according to Google Picture Search, is more like these guys with, like, standing in front of servers and stuff and looking important, but it's more like, yeah, quite, quite nerdy, I'd, I'd, I'd say. Um, so basically, looks like this. And I'll continue when I have to hear the first laughs. OK, let's continue. So um, <laughs> this, this talk is about on, on, on built on some research and experience uh, from uh, me, colleagues, people uh, who uh, I spoke to after giving this talk. Uh, and it's supposed to give you a guideline on choosing uh, a system which might need, which would help you. Uh, so this is definitely uh, one of the talks tools you should know and tools you should be aware about, uh, aware of uh, in, uh, on, for data science. Um, and I also have to do a disclaimer, some of these ratings are subjective. It's not about the ratings, it's more about like the process. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's talk. So 
what are the database, the added benefits of a database for data scientists anyway? So you have a common source of data, so you don't have to share files and look what's the last, the, the most recent version. Um, you can avoid redundancies of the files. You have persistence. They're optimized for handling and accessing uh, data for decades. I mean, databases are really old. They're like, they're all like, go back for 40 years. Um, uh, um, the scalability and also uh, since you can have operations really close to the data on, on a database system. So um, this is like a quick recap on database history. So in the, in the 60s, we had like navigational uh, um, database uh, system, disks and ROM. So this is what you see in old science fiction movies with like these rotating things and big labs, like these old supercomputers. And, and, but in the 70s, I would argue databases got seriously with uh, relational database um, um, systems. In the 80s, databases moved to the desktop. Uh, in the 90s, they got object oriented. And in the 2000s, we had the whole no SQL movement. So let's start with the uh, inventors or the relational databases. They were the first, so they um, have to be noticed first. Um, so the relational database, I think most of you know, uh, records are organized in tables. So there's rows um, of the tables, and they all are interconnected by unique keys. Um, the, data li the data is ideally normalized, so you don't have any redundancies in the data. Um, and the data uh, can be denormalized for we, for performance. We will look at that later. And the transactions are acid. So what's to do? Atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. So basically, I, I'd say a relational database is always like the, the truth. There's only one truth, and you will find it in a relational database. And this is one of the big gaps to not only SQL systems. We will see later. So this is just like a little catch up. So you see there's a lot, a lot, a lot of databases um, around here. Um, so and how they basically are, um, uh, they interact. So you could look at database history also like this. And this is just like the relational database systems. And this is like how this works. How do people decide on a new database? It looks like this. <coughs> okay. So nobody thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, uh, relational database, the benefits are they are widely used and supported. They were, are well researched. Um, they have a very comprehensive querying language. The SQL language is like very uh, a common language, and it's actually like the mother of many querying languages. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's really well researched and optimized. And basically, to make a little visualization of a relational database system, this is like this. You see the tables, and they're all connected by keys. and this is like just like one example, and they also they may look like this as well if you have a system which is just a little bit bigger. Or it may also look like this, um, and this is actually where we come to the downsides. Um, one of the downsides is the schemas are fixed. You have to define everything up front. So, and also after that, there are probably some specialist systems which are a little bit lax on that. So I'm generalizing a bit to give you like the, the an, an overview. Um, so uh, you have to basically decide a lot of stuff up front, uh, which is probably n totally irrelevant for your project. Um, and this is like a real pain. Actually, this was the main reason that drove me to using no SQL systems, because I had a web scraping project, and I just wanted to save the data and not worry about the schema and what I, what I want to actually store in the system in the very beginning. Actually, I want to store stuff in the system, work on it, and drain knowledge from that, and not worry about schemas. Um, so the relational database systems are like a schema-first um, system. Um, they, and so altering a schema is not trivial. Uh, you may know like database admins are not the super popular people in, uh, <laughs> yes, in, in, in enterprises, but don't blame them. They also have to defend, to defend the schema. Like, I mean, if you look at the schema like this, and you have a whole enterprise with all the enterprise needs, and most like you work, everything's working, you have to be really careful before you change a schema, because it might destroy stuff for others. So it's, it's don't blame them for being like defenders of uh, a schema. Um, so it's difficult to scale out, because it's uh, given the schema, and um, there's only like few data structures, like tables and rows. Um, so this is why people came up with the NoSQL types, like or NoSQL um, databases. So these are like the, there are multiple types of SQL, uh, NoSQL types, and it's not 
know against SQL, it's not only SQL. Uh, that's how we read it nowadays. So we have key value stores, which is like very simple, key value, um, which is probably not so super useful for a bigger data science project. And we have document databases in a JSON style, so you can have like a JSON uh, um, file, and um, basically you can store a dictionary in a database from um, the Python perspective. And we have these white column databases. Um, they, they look like elevation databases from the outside, but they aren't. Um, so the columns are not fixed. They're also like really flexible and can be really very efficient on huge data sets. Um, and there's the graph databases. So there's like three, four more types, and three of them are, I argue, relevant for us. The no uh, SQL database benefits are there's no need to normalize. There's nothing you need to decide up front. Um, you can maintain CLOPS complex data structure. So you can basically store multidimensional data in a document-based database without defining anything up front. Um, it supports data sharding because since the data is not as torn apart as in a, um, a relational database, it's really easier to um, spread the information across multiple servers and, um, and, and have a really reliable uh, scaling system here, um, which can have like the benefits of more security or maybe scalability and, of course, performance. Um, so, um, and there's, of course, new ways to query all this. So, um, the no SQL data, they also have downsides. So, the, the, the shiny thing is it's not always like the best, you know, deep learning. We learned that um, today or, the, or during conference. Um, so, there's a concept of eventual consistency, which I would argue is not a real problem for database something because the data will be eventually consistent. And it can be like a, a second, milliseconds. And it's not uh, like, it's not because like, it depends on your, your mother language actually. In Germany, eventual is more like, yeah, maybe, yeah, but it's not a maybe, it's just, it's happening. It's just like a matter of time when this is going to be happening. Um, you have uh, flexibility, requires more responsibilities. For example, we have, um, open schema, so you don't need to define a schema up front before you can add data, for example, into a document store like MongoDB. But of course, your reliability is, okay, if you want to store an integer, you have to store an integer and you have to make sure in your code you store an integer because the relational database, uh, the NoSQL database might not force you. There are tools to force that, but I think that's not practical. So it's also like uh, responsibilities are moving, but um, I think it's nice because you can actually look at everything in your code and you don't need to look into the database for that. So a, a quick bird's eye view on, uh, we've learned about relational databases and uh, no SQL databases. So let's have, where do we stand um, actually? So this is, um, uh, uh, a screenshot I have taken from dbengines.com and highlighted just like the top 10. Um, you probably might read it. We have Oracle, NoSQL, Microsoft, SQL, Postgre, MongoDB, DB2, Redis, Cassandra, HBase, and Amazon's DynamoDB. According to this site's ranking, which is probably not the only ranking, but I think it's a good ranking, you see, okay, well, you see like the players there and then the new players basically come from 2013 to 2013. So there's a constant movement. No SQL is getting more and more popular. But where do we stand if we split the whole thing? Uh, they also assign points on the relevance or like the, how often da databases are used. And this is a clear picture that relational databases, they are um, very dominant. So this is Oracle, MySQL, um, Microsoft SQL. And actually, this is Postgres. This is the first. Uh, open source also, but MySQL is also open source, uh, they, but they tend to change the open source license from time to time. So, um, uh, so yeah, we see there's still a big dominance in the relational database systems to the NoSQL. We have to take two things into, um, uh, into account. Of course, NoSQL systems are pretty new. There's only 10 years, and there's like 40 years. And of course, once as a larger enterprise has settled for one system, they will, you cannot just like plug and play and change database systems. So they will be there for quite some time because companies don't change that quick. But yeah. So um, there's like two consistency models uh, of databases. Uh, I've uh, already mentioned ACID and, uh, um, and they're the, the counter concept uh, from uh, NoSQL is base. 
You see, this is a little, little made up because acid and base, it goes so well together. <laughs> so, uh, but this is basically make many people from relational databases have big problems with base, and especially also like the cap theorem that data may be eventually become consistent. And also, from schema design, uh, it can give you a headache. Actually, the first year I worked with NoSQL, I had this uh, little bird in my back of my brain and said, this feels, doesn't feel right because when I was thinking about data structures and databases, I had this like picture of tables in, in, in my mind, and I had to change it. And you know, like changing routines can be a little bit was like instinct kicking in and feel busy. But it was totally worth it to ignore the little bird um, and, and move there. So um, let's do some comparisons. So what's open source? Um, so uh, since we are an open source. <laughs> Community, I think we should favor open source uh, software. So um, um, these are like, this is like the open source check. Uh, you see there's like uh, open source. You see also like there's a lot of mixture models. There's a community edition or uh, an open source database like MongoDB, but they also offer um, uh, professional support for money because of course they have to live from something as well. Or Cassandra uh, is also open source. It's uh, in the Apache stack, but there's also uh, companies who provide professional services around it. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's, and then one thing, Amazon Dynamo, DynamoDB is of course also only a database as a service. It's only available in the Amazon cloud, um, for example. So I settled for the following contenders uh, being representative of the types we see. Um, so we have uh, PostgreSQL um, for the relational database systems, uh, MongoDB as a document store, Cassandra for white column store, and Neo4j for graph. And just a little catch up on that. So we've seen relational database systems, so tables and multiple tables interconnected by keys is a database. A document oriented database stores JSON-like objects. So basically, imagine like, yeah, JSON, I think every, everybody knows JSON here, don't you? Yeah, okay, great. Multiple of these uh, binary JSON documents basically are a collection, and multiple collections are again a database. So, and usually you keep the data schema and how your JSON files looks like very similar here in the collections. I mean, it's not like doing your taxes in a big shoebox or something like that. It's, it's, it's basically, you have quite consistent schemas here. This is something is, which is very often misunderstood. Oh, you have a collection, just put anything there. Of course, you want to have similar stuff in there because otherwise you have to query the stuff you're looking for. Um, Cassandra uh, is a different system and it's really that might take some time until you can get your head around. Um, it's, uh, we have a, still like, we have frozen columns, but we store them in a more vertical way, uh, which is like, huh, why? Um, so basically, like uh, to make it a little bit uh, easier, you, you store like keys and you have the columns here and they, but the columns might change uh, from time to time. Uh, and Cassandra is also like a little bit, you can imagine it like a, a system with like many nodes co interconnecting and finding each other. Um, so these systems can really grow. It's very like a peer-to-peer -peer system. And uh, Cassandra is the only database I'm aware of which is faster in, 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 in writing than reading. <laughs> because usually it's the other way around. So uh, graphs, um, I think everybody's aware of graphs. So um, a graph database is, again, we have like nodes um, and they are basically, and then they have connections and uh, they can also have, the nodes can have attributes. And so basically it's a graph. So you see, this is a totally different setup here. So um, a quick look on the uh, cap uh, theory, uh, theorem is basically, uh, the cap theorem says uh, you can have only like two, you can only guarantee for two of these, but not all of them at the same time. So there's always like a trade off. And uh, you see like the different uh, no SQL systems or se systems settled for uh, one of the two. So let's make uh, start making a choice. How hard we, I'm trying now to ask the right questions to make a good selection for in the context of um, uh, data science. Uh, so how hard is it to collect data? Um, and the relation database system, it depends on the schema complexity actually. Um, so, and uh, especially if you have multiple data sources, so you have to uh, think quite some time, how will, the, how will the data look like? And um, 
and, and adapt the schema for that. Uh, in MongoDB, it's quite easy because you have these document structures and you can just like have the stuff, put the stuff in there. Um, in Cassandra, um, you have to pre predefine stuff as well, but I would also argue it's, it's easy once it's being set up. And on Neo4j, I'd argue, yeah, it's easy as well, but you have to put in a graph. So you basically, yeah, it only stores graph. It cannot store anything. Uh, like, that, like not everything without setups should be a graph. Uh, data retention uh, actually is uh, also a little bit um, different. So, um, and what about data types? Because it's, uh, it's important because um, a classic, for me at least, in my um, experience with systems is, oh, you, you get data from outside, you read them from an XML or some, some, some outside source or web scraping, and you store, and it's, it, it happens really easy, you store a string. You want to store an integer, but you store it as a string because the data source changes or um, you just missed it in the code um, on the data cleansing. So um, you can enforce, um, uh, how can you enforce data types because we want to have clean data types in our database because they are a tool. They should help and support us in the data science projects. So, um, Postgres of course, you have to predefine a schema, so this is very enforcing, basically. Uh, MongoDB, it's possible. You can do it in the code, but you can also like have MongoDB handle it on uh, warning or um, uh, not allowing uh, some anything which is not uh, be, which you have ex which you have excluded before in the data types. Uh, Cassandra, yes, you have to come up with a schema before as well. And in Geo4j, yes, and parentheses because yes, of course, but graphs and uh, graph stuff only. Um, the flexibility in the data types, um, basically, I think there's a, in Postgres SQL, this has also a no SQL feature I want to mention, so you can have like extra attributes in a JSON like format as well, stored in no SQL, in a Postgres SQL, and of course, you can also enforce it. And yeah, basically, that's, that's, that's a big overview here. Um, how hard is it to consolidate data? Basically, yeah, of course, with the relational database system, you have to build a schema up front. Um, in MongoDB, because you can basically shovel stuff in and consolidate later, I think I would argue it's quite easy uh, because it's a two-step process and a not anticipating something and looking later process. And Cassandra, um, it's, uh, it depends a lot on the partitioning. I've, I've mentioned like the Cassandra clusters can be, become really huge and you have to manage them. So it depends on, on, on the cluster actually. And in Neo4j, I would just like say, yeah, yes, because like that's the database is built for graphs and handling big graphs. Um, same for missing data, like similar for missing data. Uh, for example, like uh, in a document store, you can basically just shovel data in and have like data cleansing, validation, look for missing data, decide on how you want to handle missing data or dirty data. You can make it a two-step process because it's quite simple. You have a document and you can just like say, okay, you just add another attribute to your document store and said, okay, this has been processed and it's basically approved and true. And then you can basically uh, make it a two-step two process, which can be uh, helpful because first look at the data and then and make the decisions. Um, uh, persisting uh, a clean data set is, is easy in all, all of them. Once you've made it, uh, you pull through like, yeah, okay, it's uh, obvious the database is there for persisting data, so this is easy in all systems. Um, next question, how hard is it to write against query web databases? Because, I mean, it's great to have a data store, but you also have, there's a need to talk to it. So on the languages, uh, we see uh, Postgres FL is SQL. Um, so basic queries are easy. I think everybody should know basic SQL language. Um, because also for the other reason, for example, like Cassandra is CSQL, but it's very similar. Uh, to SQL, and also Cypher from Neo4j is very similar. It's all like very similar uh, SQL context. So SQL was like um, the mother for many other querying languages, so they are quite easy to learn and to do knowledge transfer here. Uh, MongoDB has um, MQL, which is also not too difficult. Uh, actually features two ways you can directly query the database, but it also has like an aggregation uh, framework, which is specialized for data aggregation. And uh, this is a little different to the rest of the uh, SQL language, but uh, the concepts are basically very similar, so it's not too hard to adapt. Um, advanced queries on uh, SQL, I would argue, 
can become hard because you really need to think in sets and you need to be aware of how um, to, to, add, to, 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 to do joints. We have a look later as well. Um, in MongoDB, you can build a little bit up on a system. Cassandra, basically, it's the same. Once you go into a SQL space, it becomes hard once things stuff becomes complex. Um, and I'll tell, show you uh, why in, in a bit. So how hard is uh, the querying to learn? I would say it's all easy to medium once and you do basic queries. And um, the advanced stuff, uh, it can become hard. Uh, but I, I'd argue for most, if you collect data and want to store them in a, in, a, in a database to help you to have like an assistant for data science project, you probably will stay in the basic query space. Yeah, so you just not to have to worry too much about it. Um, about like advanced queries, but it depends on the structure. Um, so the no, the SQL benefits and downsides. We have a common standard. It's long established. It's well researched. It's the mother of many other um, querying languages, and it has a set-based logic. And if you can think in sets, it's great. It's very helpful. Um, complexity increases fast. Badly designed joins. So what the join? If we have like multiple tables and we want to basically join the data together again they can also um, drain performance if they are badly designed. So if you do a lot of joins in a huge system, uh, it can become difficult and it can also, um, basic, uh, and it can also drain performance from the system. Um, the overhead of understanding a large schema can be it take some time, well, if, especially if it's not well documented. <laughs> so, and also set-based logic can be also like a downside if you don't like set-based logic. So this is a simple SQL query. Um, so select an employee and some, some, some attributes from a table called employees and a higher date is just like super simple. Um, this is basically just a human asking a question. But this is not really super complex, but you see already it can easily be, it's not really readable because we have to see, okay, this is like an inner join. We select something here. Um, how does this play together? And it's not really readable in just like one minute. You need some time and you need more, a lot of, uh, knowledge about the system to understand that. Um, in Cassandra, it's very simple. This is a simple Cassandra uh, query. Um, you see it's very very similar to SQL. Um, Neo4j is also like a simple Neo4j uh, query. Uh, you see all like the match and, and optional stuff is a little bit different, but you see still like there's uh, the SQL mindset behind it. Um, MongoDB does stuff a little differently uh, because they have a pipeline concept. So basically we have like a, a match, then we get data back, and then we have a data set, and we work on this data set, sort it, do a grouping, and just count for something like a, a, a date, how many releases on the date, um, and do a projection to get um, uh, data out. Um, so And these aggregation pipelines uh, are a little bit different because like you basically pass on data to the next stage so they are a little bit easier to develop because you can develop them step by step and see um, the outcome so it's quite handy so how hard is it to run because like being a database admin is maybe not your uh, the, the dream come true but how can you basically set up a database in your own ecosystem without having too much trouble. Um, so the setup actually is quite easy for all of them. So, uh, if you, for example, work on a Mac, you can use Homebrew to install them, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite easy. Um, maintenance is, yeah, it depends, of course, on the complexity and on the reads, writes, and deletes and stuff. Uh, so uh, it's also like handleable. Um, so if you have a huge Cassandra cluster, it can become intense because Cassandra does write new stuff when you delete something, um, or like it's 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 like it's it's optimized for sequential uh, reading and writing. Um, and backup uh, is. Uh, it, it depends on your backup strategy. Uh, so of course, uh, it's quite easy to replicate the NoSQL systems because you have like um, a primary server, like one basically uh, um, uh, one master, uh, or like like one, one one database, and other just making copies of the database. And of course, this is quite easy to make backups from this because you have these siblings, uh, uh, and you just can take one sibling off and store it somewhere and bring it back up online again, and, and um, that's 
it's solvable also in the relational database systems. And of course, they're also like trying to catch up now. So it's not impossible, but maybe more complex and maybe only with um, a commercial solution. Um, how hard is it, because one of the main questions, how hard is it to run analytics, especially without affecting the performance of the production system? Um, so again, here is quite similar with the backups. Uh, so no SQL systems, you can have like extra copies and servers, and you can just say, for example, in MongoDB there's like, you can have like a hidden node. So this is like a, a replica set which copies data from the, the system over, but it does not take part in votes, it will never become a primary you can write on. So basically, it's a backup system. You can have like a, in your desk computer if you have enough space and a nice connection and just work uh, your analysis on there without affecting any of the um, um, uh, uh, production systems. So that's, that's quite nice. And of course, like in the uh, relational databases, you probably want to work on a nightly backup or like a, a, a copy here. Um, skip that. This is just like an example on horizontal scaling. So we just saw what we call horizontal scaling in uh, uh, no SQL systems, and uh, the other is vertical scaling. So uh, this is basically you, 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 or called sharding. So uh, we have different, uh, we tear apart the, 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 the data apart. Basically, you can imagine if this was a phone book, if this was A to D, and this was basically S to Z, for example. So we have some keys splitting the data. And uh, of course, you can have more servers and power involved, and this is uh, also like help for performance. And of course, you can also like combine both of them. Yeah. So, um, if you already is there an existing system, I'd say it's quite easy to add them to an existing system. So, uh, if your company manager or somebody in your company tells you it's impossible with another database system, hey. It's actually easy to add because it's just like another database system. It's not that you have to fully integrate into all the processes of your company. So it's, it's, it's fairly easy, I'd, I'd argue. Um, to access and change these systems in authorization, um, I probably think if it's just like an extra database for a data science project, this is not the major issue. But of course, enterprises have to take care of who has access to the data, but all databases have decent systems to have uh, user or role-based uh, access to uh, up to field level or at least collection level. And so I think this should be um, fair enough for that. To add new data, so if something new comes on, uh, how can you basically add it? Um, uh, it depends, again, on the, on, 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 the, on, on the schema of the relation database systems and with the others. It's, I'd say, easy. Um, no JS, of course, graph data only here. Um, and I think this is one of the major points for data science projects, actually. How hard is it to understand the data structure? And this is, I think, in a small system, it's easy anyway. Um, simple tables, simple documents. But once the data structures become more complex or multidimensional, it's becoming really hard in a relational database system. We have all, we, because we tear it apart with, into all these tables being interconnected by IDs. In Cassandra, you can have like a hardly partition setup, and also Cassandra has uh, one of the concepts of Cassandra to get more performance. Also, you have a lot of redundant data in there because it has a primary key and only a secondary key. You cannot like in a, like as in a um, uh, relational database system or MongoDB like um, uh, index multiple columns or like bolt keys. So it's Cassandra has a total different setup here. Um, it's super optimized for writing for re for writing huge amounts of data. Um, and so actually, like, I think I really favor the, the document stuff because it's, let's, let's have a look. So this is, if you, if you ask for something from Cassandra, this is like the output. Yeah, you see like we have the column, the volumes, and timestamps, and Cassandra basically stores stuff as tuples. Um, I think a graph is also like really easy to understand. Then there are some uh, uh, great tools out there to, to, to visualize graphs from Neo4j. So I think graphs, depending of course on the density on, 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 uh, and other stuff, but graphs I think are really nice to, to read and understand. And um, the relational model, it depends a lot on the table stru uh, on, on the how many tables are involved. So this is, for example, like a comparison between relational and document model. Um, and this is just like a simple address here on the left side. So, and it's already five tables involved just for my phone number. And 
feel free to give me a call any time. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so it's, um, uh, yeah, and a document model, and this is, I think, one of the nice things. You don't have to explain anything. <laughs> yeah, you can give this to any anybody. Okay, forename, last name. Of course, you, you have to worry about the attributes you probably use, but once this is like nicely labeled, it's super simple. You can pass this on to anybody, and it's 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 it's, it's really nice because it's a lot of explaining and communication. And if communication is involved, misunderstandings will follow. <laughs> it's in, in the nature of human communication. Um, so there's also like nice tools to visualize. This is a, call, a tool called Compass from uh, MongoDB. It can even visualize uh, um, geographical data. This is. Italy, if you see, for example. So you can also use this to check data types, to get some um, sample, like for example, it samples uh, a thousand documents. You can see what is in a database, what's the distribution of values. Um, this is an example for Neo4j. You can also like visualize graphs and check queries. Probably not the most important thing for data science projecting how to handle growth. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 it, it can be accomplished. It's not super um, uh, hard, but I think if you want to handle growth, uh, it's uh, probably the time to get like a database expert uh, involved. Uh, some more use cases, except for storing data, also like data from outside sources, is uh, you can even store model parameters if you train models. You can make them persistent in a database, share them with others, um, maybe also like distribute um, the whole, your whole um, setup of documenting experiments. Um, so the conclusion here, um, so I hope I've given you a good guideline for making uh, an educated decision on whether a database can help you on, uh, as a tool uh, in, in data science projects. So the first thing is analyze all your real needs and focus only on them. If you work graphs, it's the simplest, yeah, go for a graph database. I mean, yeah, you can, yeah, so. Um, Choose something which is accessible and a simple solution for you, yeah, because like, it's always like these, there's like, hundreds of database systems around them. Many times people approach me, I've heard about this new database, and they yeah, say, well, maybe it be a highly specialized system that might help you, but maybe you should really think about it, whether it's, there's a, lot, there's a small community, maybe it's a commercial vendor, and you don't, we don't really want vendor lock-in, and we don't want like highly specialized and depend on very, maybe a startup company with a nice idea, but you also have to think, will it make, will it make it, actually? And do not only focus on performance. Because many people only worry about performance. Oh, what's the database performance? Yeah, I mean, like, hmm? yeah. So, um, so also, like, I would encourage you to try and play with the stuff. It's usually, like, the simple, like a simple setup. It's easy to install with Homebrew on the Mac, or uh, there's great tutorials and everything. So try and choose something you feel uh, uh, basically comfortable with. Uh, because, like, a, we, 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 we use it, it's a tool to get stuff done. So uh, I'd say for a good general choice, if you have just temp table data, I think go for a relational database if it's like not complex system. If you have general usage or like um, multi-dimensional data, I would really suggest have a look at MongoDB because it makes this really easy. If you work on graphs, go for Neo4j. It's a graph database that's as good as it gets. Um, so, um, yeah, and if you're new in the, in the whole database space, some stuff to look into. Um, um, also, like a document store, again, lightens the weight of understanding like schemas and how to do joins. Uh, so this is, this is a nice thing. Um, no matter what, um, try to take some time to lay it to learn at least basic SQL because it's everywhere and you will, I guarantee you will have can reuse it and build on the knowledge. Uh, this is a very good scheme. Also look into tools like SQL Alchemy if you work, uh, it's a Python uh, uh, framework, which can uh, help you on working uh, or creating a, da a rational database and basically so the data stored as objects and distributing all the stuff into tables. SQL Alchemy takes uh, care of that. So. Uh, I also want to thank for contributing uh, to this talk uh, after so to Jens Dietrich. Uh, he's a professor at Uni Saarland, and he gave me some really value. He's like doing a lot of stuff on database performances and research, and he gave me some uh, really good feedback and comments uh, of this. So this is also like a talk uh, in progress. So if I run into some 
database specialist for a very specific system I'm or a data scientist, I'm really happy to see, to hear comments and how we can uh, improve this. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, Are there any questions? Oh. Yeah, I two, three. Okay. Uh. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, really interesting talk. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on some of the other kind of more column storage style databases like Kudo or ClickHouse or quite modern. Actually, but I, I don't know all of them because there's just too many and um, uh, I, I used to work a lot with databases but it's not my prior, uh, 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 yeah, my, that's not my, my first domain, so on, on yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just like I try and play, play with that because there's some great stuff also like I think uh, if you do something blockchain, also like uh, uh, this was like blockchain DB to look into it. So it's, 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 it's a jungle there. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was just very curious about uh, what is your opinion on uh, the JSON data type in Postgres compared to using MongoDB? I think in Postgres you have the schema and you can basically say this column is an integer and you can basically predefine everything up front. Uh, in MongoDB um, you can, I think, since 3.2 or 3.4, you can have also like a predefined schema in MongoDB and it can throw you a warning if the data type does not match and it can also like say, throw an exception if you want to enforce a data type. Usually I handle it, uh, I use um, uh, a library called Eve, uh, uh, it's a Python library and you can predefine schemas and also like uh, data types which are allowed. So uh, I usually use that, validate anything I write to the database via Eve and you can have like a nice rule set there because on some data types I really want to be sure this is an integer and this is so Eve is really helpful and uh, and uh, it's really nice because you can uh, have it in your code and not in a separate database um, uh, configuration file uh, so yeah. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the use cases I've seen in uh, data science projects that you didn't mention on your list there was um, creating lots of intermediate versions of data. So you start with the clean data and you have mm -hmm. your weird features and then you have some mm -hmm. other version of the weird features. Mm -hmm. Now that's probably a problem that shouldn't be solved in the database, but mm -hmm. have you seen databases being used in that way, for example, oh, actually, versions uh, of tables and things like that? I would not. I would, you mean like to store pictures in a database? Well, different, having like different versions of tables that represent different mm -hmm. features you've generated along the way, yeah. and kind okay. of, and the challenge of keeping track of those as well, I guess. I'm maybe. not sure whether I get the question. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, adding a field to a document store to say uh, this has been processed in a particular way. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, that's not really so basically, for example, imagine you have some. Let's let's use something really simple. We get some data from an outside data source, and basically the first you basically it's just like an abstraction of jobs. So one step is just like yeah, just get in a database as is, just like in maybe a document style structure. And then you can basically go to your database. And um, what I usually did, I set for uh, an attribute processed just true false. I just query for something has this been processed or checked or validated, how you want to call it, and then just like iterate over it and validate the data, check the data. Um, this is like also another approach, especially if you, for example, I use that for web scraping because in the web scraping, you, I wanted to store the, um, some JSON or like some JavaScript JSON documents from a website. So it was allowed to change. So um, uh, it's, 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 and, and the, the, the other nice thing is you can also scale this out. So if you have a database, you can have multiple agents querying the database and um, basically pre post process everything you have in the pipeline. Like that. Okay, thank you. Yep. So thank you. Um, so you mentioned that in Postgres you can also like have like some kind mm -hmm. of NoSQL things with the JSON column. In your experience, uh, what are the pros and cons of using like JSON format in Postgres versus using MongoDB? Uh, actually, I, I understand it. It's just like an extra feature of of, of uh, uh, Postgres. So mm -hmm. to lighten, so basically in Postgres you have like a, basically a basic schema you maybe 
you are sure of and uh, it's it's an additional feature you have like a more like open space so I think it's a nice combination if you have some unexpected data so um, yeah it's just like a nice add-on um, I'm not sure about how performant the uh, querying SQL uh, JSON documents in Neo I mean uh, Postgres actually is um, so I would love to hear feedback from if anybody's like a Postgres super expert here um, yeah Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and if, uh, if you have any other questions, I'm around, just come talk to me. Thank you. <laughs>